It was a warm, bright Southern California day, and my son Wyatt and I ventured outside to pursue the noble art of bubble blowing. We had wands of all shapes and sizes and were making a good effort to get as soapy as possible. It hadn't been more than 10 minutes when another boy Wyatt's age pulled up in his new Power Wheels. Now, if you don't know what a Power Wheels is, it's a toddler-sized car with an electric motor. This is probably the coolest toy a two-year-old boy could ask for because he can drive it himself. The boy and his dad stopped to say hi, and the boy jumped off his ride to join in the bubble fun. Now, Wyatt wasn't too keen on sharing, so a small battle ensued over possession of the bubble wand. Both grabbed and yanked, trying to gain purchase of the soapy prize. After veiled threats from both me and the other dad, the boys finally relented and took turns. But Wyatt hovered over the other boy during his turns, more than anxious to regain the wand and blow his own bubbles. While he waited, the other father asked if he'd like to ride his son's power wheels. Wyatt, I said, come over here. You get to drive this Jeep. But Wyatt was so focused on the task at hand, he didn't even respond. I tried again and again and again to get his attention, to offer him something much better than bubbles, but he was too distracted to notice. Eventually, the boy and his dad left, and the opportunity was gone. Wyatt had his bubbles back to himself, but because he was so distracted, he missed out on something far better. Do you ever feel like that? Like, maybe you were so distracted by the task at hand that you missed out on something far better? Now, I don't know everything you want out of life, but I do know what you don't want. You don't want to waste it, right? You don't want to focus on what doesn't matter. But if we're honest with ourselves, we don't really know what to focus on. With so many responsibilities and distractions competing for our time, how do we choose what's better? I hate not knowing personally. And when I don't know what to focus on, I get worried, upset, fearful. How do I get everything done that needs to get done and still have time for the important stuff? Is what I think is the important stuff really even the important stuff? I mean, how do you really know? The good news is, we don't have to figure this out on our own. In the Bible, Jesus has a lot to say about worries and distractions and what to do with them. And what he says is quite countercultural. He doesn't say to work harder or to do more to gain insight and banish worry. Instead, he says that putting God first is not only the antidote to worry, but also the better way to live your life. It is only through a real and genuine relationship with God that we gain peace and fulfillment. We choose God because He first chose us. That is how we pursue what is better in life. Simple, but not easy. I struggle with this all the time, and I know a lot of you do too, but it was also a huge issue when Jesus was still walking the earth. In the book of Luke, we read of Jesus going to visit some of his friends and of the very different ways in which they reacted to his presence. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary chose better? What does that mean? What did she choose that Martha didn't? The answer is Jesus. She chose better because she chose Jesus. And we need to do the same thing. To pursue the best, we choose Jesus over activity. Now, before you freak out, I'm not saying that all of our activities are bad. In fact, many of them are responsibilities we can't do without. Good responsibilities that help provide for our family, show our friends they're important, maybe show us how to put others before ourselves. And it was the same with Martha. Her desire to prepare a large meal for Jesus and his disciples was not only good, but necessary. She had a horde of hungry men to feed. It would have taken a lot of money and a lot of effort. So where did she go wrong? It was her attitude. 
when you look at this story, you see Martha working and Mary worshiping. And the Christian life isn't a choice between the two. We must balance work and worship. But Martha had these out of balance. And if you're anything like me, your scale is tipped strongly to the work side too. It's not that work is bad. It's just that too much of it creates worry and distress that pulls us away from what is most important, our relationship with Jesus. In Martha's case, God was teaching from her very own living room and she was too distracted to listen. You can think about it like this. Have you ever ordered the wrong thing at a restaurant? Maybe it's your first time somewhere like the Cheesecake Factory and the huge 40 page menu is just getting you down. You blindly point to a meal and when it comes out, your heart sinks. <laughs> what your friend got looks so much better. I should have ordered that, you say. The same was true for Martha. While she was busy in the kitchen, Jesus was serving the better meal and she was missing out on it. She didn't make the right choice. We don't want to miss out. We want better in life. And Jesus, more attentive than the best waiter, tells us what to do. Not to focus on activity done for him, but on time spent with him. What we do with Christ is more important than what we do for Christ. We balance work and worship and choose Jesus over activity. But another lesson we learn from Jesus in this story is to pursue the best we build into eternity. You can tell by Martha's demands of Jesus that she was upset with Mary's behavior. She implied that Mary did something wrong. Mary was lazy. Mary was selfish. She skipped out on her duties. But it was exactly the opposite. What Martha pursued would soon be gone. All the food would be eaten. All the drinks would be drunk. In the end, all that would be left was a big pile of dirty dishes. But what Mary pursued, time spent at the feet of Jesus, would last for eternity. A lot of times, I work myself into a frenzy to pursue what won't last. I bet you do too. Maybe it's material things like a new motorcycle or a TV. Maybe it's recognition from coworkers or loved ones, or possibly even the pleasure of a really good meal. And all that stuff is great if it's enjoyed in its proper time and place. But when it becomes the reason to live, when it takes first place in our lives, we mess up. None of it will last. The only thing that will last forever is God in us. Nothing else. So what do you think we should spend our time on? In the Bible, Paul tells us that each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Now, what does that mean? Well, Paul tells us that Jesus must be the foundation for our lives. We just learned that from Martha's story, right? We choose Jesus over activity. But Paul also shows us that we choose how to invest our time while we live. You have a choice of how to spend your time. What we build into our lives that will last, time building relationships with God and others, will be rewarded. What we build into our lives that will not last, everything else, will be lost. We spend time with God because it will last. And while we spend time with God, our relationship with Him deepens. We begin to know and understand His heart, to see His will, and to become more like Him. No one can take this away from you. This is a guarantee that He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That is why Mary chose better. And we can too. We pursue time with God first to last for eternity. So, we build into eternity, but what about now? What about today? If we pursue God above everything else, what about everything else? Shortly after his meeting with Mary and Martha, Jesus taught a profound message about worry and need. And you can't help but wonder if this was partly in response to Martha's struggles. Worry and need are something all of us deal with, right? So, 
Jesus is teaching and he points to some ravens. God feeds them and you're much more valuable. Then he points to the lilies growing right around the crowd. Look how beautiful these lilies are clothed, he says. If God clothes them, he will clothe you too. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world, that's those who don't trust in God, runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. To pursue the best, we rest in God's amenity. That's God's riches, his, his luxury. The Bible says God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, you may not need any cows, but what this tells us is that God owns everything. It's all his. And he can spread out resources how he sees fit. If he can care for birds and flowers, which are here today and gone tomorrow, how much more do you think he will care for you? It's a promise that when we seek God first, he will give us what we need. Not what we want, but what we need. My wife is always reminding me of the difference between these two words. To go back to our meal analogy, this isn't just like ordering the better meal, but it's like ordering the better meal and getting dessert too. When we pursue Jesus, we get an amazing relationship with him and all of our needs met. How much better is that than trying to go after what we think we need on our own and then failing, or realizing we went after the wrong thing altogether? But God will never give you the wrong thing. So. What do you worry about most? Family, mm, career, money, all of the above? Knowing that God will provide in these areas is the antidote to worry. And it allows us to seek him first. And if you catch yourself worrying, pray. Tell God what you need. The Bible says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Instead of being anxious like Martha, we thank God and ask him to meet our needs. And look what the result of that is. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How would you like to have a peace so deep it's unexplainable outside of God? This verse is promising you can have it when you pray for your needs. Rely on God's provision and you will inherit God's peace. So, we choose Jesus over activity, we build into eternity, and we rest in God's amenity. We choose God first because he first chose us. So, what does this mean for our lives? How do we live this out? We must do less to be more. There are a lot of activities that need doing, but remember to put God before all of them. You may need to cut some out and reprioritize others, but spend time at the feet of Jesus every day. How do we spend time with Jesus? Well, we talk to him through prayer and we listen to him through reading his word, the Bible. Now, I know it just sounds like I told you to do less and then turned around and told you to do more by praying and reading the Bible. The difference with these activities is that they aren't doing in the sense of checking chores off a to-do list, they grow from a desire to be with God, to want to know Him better. And the activities that you do have to do, a lot of the activities you do are necessary and not bad in themselves. Just do them with the right attitude, a worshipful attitude. Do everything as if you were doing it for the Lord. Finally, remember that none of this is possible without God's grace. God shows us the better life is one in pursuit of Him, and then he's the one that helps us live it out too. Listen to the Bible's words. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for thinking of us and choosing to save us before we even knew to choose you. For those of us who haven't chosen you yet, we know it's never too late. We can choose you today. We say, Jesus, we want to pursue you above everything else. We put you ahead of all of our activities, knowing that you will provide for our needs and we will be with you in eternity. God, 
Thank you for showing us how to live a life and to build into what will last. Help us rely on your grace to put you first in everything we do. Amen. Thanks for listening and God bless.